From my perspective, these objects can tell us all sorts of things um, about humans and about culture, particularly as it relates to social identity and all different aspects of identity. It can tell us about tribal identity, ethnic affiliation. It can tell us about gender identities, age, personal sort of individual identities, identities of individual artists. What does this say about the people of these ancient civilizations, these prehistoric civilizations? They definitely weren't isolated. They uh, were connected to peoples in other areas. They had probably extensive social networks that helped them trade these materials from really long distance away. You know, the, um, some of these, the marine shell objects, you know, they're from over 800 miles away. And so that would have required either traveling a very long distance directly or a lot of social relationships with other surrounding communities to acquire these materials. Copper bells are found sort of scattered across the, the Southwest in archeological context, usually not in large quantities, but we do find them particularly in larger sites, like in Chaco Canyon, um, Pueblo Benito, for example, or Aztec Ruin near Aztec, New Mexico. We know that metallurgy was not practiced prior to Spanish contact um, in the northern southwest in the ancestral Pueblo area. So um, those objects would have had been traded for. And based on their forms, they most closely resemble bells made in West Mexico. Mm. And so that tells us that they have this connection with Mesoamerica, um, this sort of uh, social relationships may have facilitated br bringing these materials in from very far away. What are some of the most enduring themes that you have found in your study? The he she beads. I see that as a theme that from the very beginning of, of, of ornamentation, the earliest ornamentation we find in the Southwest. And those are popular for the next 2,000 years and still are today. So that's a major theme. Another one are mosaics particularly um, turquoise mosaics paired with jet and shell. And so what kind of objects do you see in New Mexico? Stone and shell beads, particularly um, little, what they're called now, he, she beads. We call them disc beads as archeologists. Those are probably the most common ornament forms that we find um, in archeological contexts in New Mexico. We find pendants of turquoise, um, shell beads, seashells uh, from the Pacific Coast and the Gulf of California. For example, abalone is from the Pacific Coast. Little olivella shell beads have been used for 2,000 years. Those are from the Gulf of California. Beads and pendants made of locally available stone, like shale and jet. Mm -hmm. So those are the main, the main types of materials and forms that we find. How do you understand innovation and creativity uh, here in New Mexico? You know, I see it all the time in my research where sort of within the context of a overarching jewelry tra tradition or similarity in form and material, you really see in the personality of individual artists come out in specific pieces. You know, maybe something is, you know, uh, assembled in a completely new and different manner or maybe there's a reference to some sort of older style that is created in a completely new medium. For example, this object that comes to mind uh, from the Albuquerque Museum exhibit, it's a choker uh, made with telephone cord and abalone pendants. And it looks almost exactly like older, similar necklaces made with tiny little olivella shells, little marine shells. And looking at them side by side, it's just amazing how, you know, there's this new, completely new contemporary material, plastic, and yet it looks just like these shells when they're strung together. So it's just this new sort of uh, reimagining of older traditional styles. As a scientist, how do you address the balance between the need to understand and respecting the objects? That's a constant sort of consideration or process that 
we have to go through, I think, as, as scientists that are studying the material that are directly related to descendant communities living now. There's a certain level of respect, not inserting sort of our modern Western bias into that. When I was doing my dissertation research, which was on um, all the jewelry from Pablo Benito and Aztec Ruin, I met with um, a few jewelers from Santa Domingo, now called Kewa. I really wanted to get their perspective on these objects because I'm not a jeweler at all. I'm not a lapidarist. And that experience, it was beautiful and it was so eye-opening for me is to hear these artists talk about you know how difficult it would have been to make certain shapes or using certain techniques or the quality of the material for example or how certain pieces are so similar to what they make now or how it might be an inspiration for future pieces they might make and it really helped to sort of get me out of my own um, sort of cultural and scientific lens and see these objects as works of art and not necessarily scientific specimens. What do we learn? I think we really learn about ourselves as humans and what makes us unique. The lesson for me in all of this is that we are both reflections of our larger cultural context, but we also have this ability to sort of personally craft our own identities, and adornment is such a big part of that. So I think that's really inspiring, this sort of personal expression and originality within a larger socio-historical context.